I would classify the whole crypto market into three things. Right, I think we need to talk about crypto. We're going to be doing this over two episodes. The first, today's episode, is with Tom Rogers, a freelance research analyst who specializes in cryptocurrencies. We're going to be talking about the impact of including cryptocurrency in an investing portfolio. What is the effect of a small amount of Bitcoin and a small amount of Ethereum in a classic 60-40 portfolio? And the second episode is a deeper look into the rather murky world of crypto exchanges and fraud in the industry. Please understand that none of what we discuss here today should be seen as financial advice. Don't invest unless you're prepared to lose all of your money. Cryptocurrency is still largely unregulated here in the UK, and you should not expect to get any kind of compensation or cover for any form of crypto related losses. It gets tied into like all of the other modern social things of like left and wokeism and all these things of like anti establishment. And I think people, people use it as a yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, Bitcoin started out as the radical anti-establishment payment yeah. system. You know, it was built basically to to get people out of the banking system, like, to build, like, an alternative payment network. That was the whole idea of it, you know. It came at a time, like, Bitcoin white paper came out 31st of October 2008. And that was a time when, like, you know, the, the world was crashing. Like, the sky was falling on people's heads, you know, the credit crunch, like, banks were just collapsing. And this is the first time people have really seen it in our era – Banks going down, you know, Lehman mm. Brothers, absolute nightmare. So you can kind of understand why people attach themselves to it so strongly, you know. Um, and it had this sort of- like It's a belief right. system more than it is a, a piece of tech. It is. And it's kind of, it's novel. It's new. At the time, it was exciting. And it's quite difficult to understand, you know. It's this kind of weird, like radical smashing together of like really hard applied maths, cryptography, um, distributed networking, which is what the internet's built on, and uh, game theory, which is like the incentive mechanism for like how you attract miners or validators to support a blockchain. So there's a lot of different difficult technology going on there, and it's not easy to understand. So I want to start uh, quite broadly then with, because you mentioned Bitcoin, you mentioned the use cases there, and I think people, most people say that what it was created for it is no longer. Mm -hmm. And yeah. people pin that all the time, but it's not currency. But mm -hmm. you know, it's almost a bad label. Yeah. You also, I know, are a big fan of Ethereum. Yeah. And I want to get into the differences and how you see them sitting in a portfolio. Yeah. But can we just start broadly with how you would describe a cryptocurrency to Yunnan? You know? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, originally Bitcoin wanted to be an alternative payment mechanism uh, that was secure um, so that you didn't have to use a financial institution. And Satoshi Nakamoto, who created Bitcoin, we still don't know who they are, um, he described it as a secure payment messaging system. Um, that was secured by cryptography that used cryptographic proofs instead of trust because trust in banks was an all-time low at that time. Um, so it started out as a payment messaging system um, and then the technology was uh, built upon by Ethereum to create a kind of uh, global online marketplace where anyone could build a business or release a token if they connected to the Ethereum network. Yeah, so it's basically like an app store. The only difference is like... Um, these are decentralized apps. So they're, um, I mean, decentralized is a word that makes people go, what? I'm lost. What are they talking about? Yeah. 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 So I mean, it's something that took me quite a long time to understand, but because I've got the time and I'm a nerd, like I'm willing to, <laughs> I'm willing to go into the nitty gritty of it. If you know what I mean? Like I've spent like six, seven years researching Ethereum and I still don't understand most of it. You know, these are hard technologies, yeah. you know, they're, they're difficult to understand. I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a cryptographer. I'm just a guy. You know, I'm just a writer. Um, so I often find that there isn't an easy way to describe it apart from saying it's an app store where anybody can launch a business. Like if if us three wanted to launch a cryptocurrency on Ethereum, we could do it in about half an hour yeah. because the technology is open source, which basically means you can go in and you can see all the code. So like the difference between open source and closed source, closed source might be uh, Microsoft Windows where they build it, but they don't let anyone see the code. But with Ethereum uh, and a lot of other blockchain technologies, it's open source. So you can go in, you can copy paste, and you can just launch a token in about half an hour. In fact, I've got my own crypto. What's it called? Uh, Curious. Curious. Yeah, yeah. So it's what we're saying about content creators. Like, So the first thing I did, my first proper job was um, I launched an online newspaper in Salford called Salford Online. Um, I would have killed for something like Ethereum to be around because... What we did and how we really grew from sort of 2008 to 2016 when it closed is using Facebook. So posting news on Facebook. 
And that sort of grew like wildfire, you know, it, it grew much faster than I could have done it on my own. Um, but all of our views and all the ad revenue went to Facebook rather than back at our site. Mm. Um, but by maybe launching a token, it's not, my token's not going to trade on an exchange. I'm not here to sell my token. You know, it's not, it's never going to trade against the dollar. You know, I'm not going to pay 350 grand to Binance to, to list it. It's really just like an incentive mechanism to get my readers to engage with my writing content on charting futures, you know? And as I say, it's not going to have any nominal value outside there, but if people share, if people like, if people contribute to research, uh, if people read books, if people recommend books, you know, I've got a chapter club where you read a book, a chapter of a book at a time, uh, then I can give them a little token, you know, um, and then they can maybe use that to get like a free subscription or a subscription for their friend or something like that. People don't have a lot of money these days, you know, so. So it's, it's for use in your ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that can be familiar to people that use, I mean, kids have certainly understand that, like, you know, uh, domestic or native currencies within games, V-Bucks, things like this. Uh, Correct. You know, there's certain currencies that exist that are for certain communities, uh -huh. right? So you took, you spoke about value there. Um, yeah. And I think this is what a lot of people will say. They'll, they'll, they find it hard to pin value on cryptocurrency. Yeah, that's right. Can we start with Bitcoin and say, where is the value there? Sure. So... I think what Satoshi Nakamoto didn't really realize was how strong people's desire to own something scarce is. Mm. That's like just human OS, man. The human operating system wants to own scarce things that other people don't own. And over time, as it has become not a payment system so much, it's just become folded into the financial system. It's now basically just collateral for banks Value. to lend. Value. You know, yeah. yeah. Is that, that value is in its financialization, mm. you know? Um, and it can be used like, you know, gold ETF or an S&P 500 ETF or any other like, like any liquid collateral to like get loans, like bank, re like bank repo. Um, and so the value really is in the scarcity of it. And that's- um, People always say that, you know, sorry to cut in, but yeah. there's only one of me. I might not be that valuable though, right? Scarcity in, is not enough. Then typically, you know, the S&P 500, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here. Of course, I do yeah. some crypto, but underpinning that are 500 businesses that produce cash flows, that yeah. produce revenues, that, that leave some kind of mark on the world as mm -hmm. such. I think people would sit there and go, scarcity isn't enough. Yeah. You know, I could yeah. color a bottle cap neon blue and it could be the only one in the world. Doesn't mean it's worth millions of quid. That's right. Yeah. But it is if people attribute value to that thing that's scarce. So like gold, gold doesn't technically have a value, but we've all decided that gold is valuable and it's a limited commodity. So it's not yeah, like we're the, building houses the, out of gold or we're like running our cars with gold. It doesn't strength, actually have a purpose. Yeah, the strength of that belief is part of who we are, you know? Um, I mean, let's say gold, for example, 10% um, of gold is used in industry for uh, plating connectors because mm. it's like a- it's Good a, conductor. Yeah, fantastic conductor. Brilliant. Can't use anything else. Well, with the price of gold going so high, um, now people want to use gold alloys because they want to like cut the amount of gold yeah. that they can use because it's expensive, man. So 10% is used in industry. 50% of the gold supply is in gold jewelry. Mostly in India as well. Mostly on me. <laughs> yeah, mostly, on me. <laughs> mostly on me, mate. Check, check. Yeah. Uh, and then 40% is in investments in gold ETFs. So 50% in jewelry is like a- uh, kind of kind of useless, kind of like a showy, kind of scarce thing. 40% yeah. in investments for collateral for banks to loan against one another and only 10% in industry. And like gold's value total is about 10 trillion. And we could say like the monetary premium, like the, the value that we ascribe to something that could be used as money, as collateral is $9 trillion, like 90% of it. So that maybe that's where I kind of pitch Bitcoin is like it's just become a financial asset. It's just been folded into the system, yeah. And I do think the 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 features that make gold attractive, perceived scarcity, mm -hmm. you can't just like pull it out of the ground, lots of it, you know, that's is what they say. They, they think they can quantify how much gold there is, blah, blah, blah. The things that, that add value to gold, Bitcoin's probably got better, you know, f functionality I think, around. I think everything that gold does in terms mm. of a financial asset, Bitcoin does better. Yeah. Okay, so you cannot counterfeit. It's impossible to counterfeit a Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, but okay, so if you heard the story, um, it was around 2020, um, a company listed on NASDAQ called uh, Wuhan King Gold, they delivered to um, a bank in Shanghai um, 20,000 bars of gold. And off the back of that, they got $2.8 billion of loans. 
when the appraisers went into the bank and actually checked the gold, they found out it's just copper gilded with gold. And they got $2.8 billion of loans off the back of that collateral, right? Um, I think it was only last year as well. There was a, um, the Perth Mint, so like the Australia yeah. Perth Mint. They tried to deliver $9 billion of gold to a bank in Shanghai. Uh, and it was found to contain mostly silver. So that's relatively easy to counterfeit at like the highest level, you know, $9 billion, right? Mm. Um, but it's impossible to counterfeit Bitcoin. Your gold there, mate. Has anyone tested that? <laughs> no, 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 you got that fool's gold, gold, don't you? We <laughs> buy it like, like yeah. Bed, yeah, it's yeah, it's chocolate money. It gets a bit hot, it gets a bit hot, my arm goes yeah. green and stuff, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can subscribe to the fact that something that exists in the digital space has lots of value because I make videos and I, I, they're like, they are assets and I won't have it any other way because I make a video, it sits there, it generates views for years. And, yeah, yeah, you passive know, income. Yeah, right? it's, it, yeah. It, I can, but, you know, I, I believe that things can have value. And I also think that maybe the main point about Bitcoin's value is that all other currencies devalue and, and it's that it holds static. And why do people value the things they do? Why is a Charizard worth half a million quid? Well, you know, scarce. It, it, I mean, yeah. scarce. Okay. So like houses with turrets, rare first edition Agatha Christie novels, Pokemon cards, like, I mean, I don't wear like nice clothes, but like nice clothes, nice trainers. If it's scarce, people tend to put a huge premium on it, you know? Hmm. Yeah. But I guess, I guess the thing is like, you know, the trainers, they fall in and out of fashion. I, is Bitcoin going to be the thing in a hundred years? Who can say? And does it worry you that the person who created it is a ghost? What's, what's, or they, what is their motives? And what's going to happen to the million coins that they have parked in a wallet when mm. they decide, oh, you know what? I'm the 25th richest person on the planet right now. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. dump these on the market. Yeah. I mean, it's never moved. You know. Doesn't mean it won't. But I mean, it is, everyone's got a price. You but have to talk about diamond hands. Yeah. Diamond hands. Diamond hands. Diamond hands. Yeah. Talk about it. Yeah. Like, how crazy would you have to be to sit exactly. on? Exactly. So this is the guy who made it. He must be mental. Or girl. Girl. Or, yeah, or, or group of programmers. Yeah. 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 Okay. Even more so. Is it a concern that there's some entity out there that controls one twenty first of all of the supply? and they haven't moved it. Just because it's never been moved doesn't mean it won't. I mean, all valid concerns. That's why I don't own any Bitcoin. You don't own any Bitcoin? <laughs> don't own any Bitcoin, no. I yeah. only own Ethereum. I'm, to be honest, I'm a big But then I'm Ethereum. obsessed with Vitalik Buterin. Yeah, the founder of Ethereum, uh, Vitalik Buterin. Yeah. He's like a weird alien child, you know, with a giant head for his massive brain. He's 190 like- 190 IQ. Yeah. He's like the master of all the nerds, I was about to say. Like, he's a top nerd boss when you <laughs> get to- The Pied Piper of nerds. The Pied Piper of nerds, I like that, yeah. But I do, I do also think that we get um, cult of personality and people follow individuals around like they're the Messiah because everyone wants to have that Pied Piper. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's pretty stupid in the real world. So Elon Musk is an example. Everyone follows him around sniffing his farts. The guy gets plenty wrong. Buying, buying a, the, one of the biggest brands in the world and renaming it X was a bad decision. Mm -hmm. you know? I think he's a dangerous chancer, to yeah. be honest. And he's a bullshitter. Yeah, yeah. He's one of these, like, who, if he wasn't in X Tesla and uh, pretending that he got a PhD, when well, he didn't, um, he'd be in crypto. Because it's a place for people to, you know, you can launch things easily. You can kind of, like, obfuscate the details. But, I mean, I know what you mean about Satoshi because I believe in Vitalik. He and, and he is transparent. He is transparent, and he believes in Ethereum as a public good. Yeah, you know they have a foundation where they they um, they launch a lot of community projects, and they have hackathons. Like that, I just see him as fundamentally a good guy. You don't know him, no. I don't know. Never yeah. met him. You, well, you must have more than just the faith in the individual. And you mm -hmm. talk about Ethereum as, you know, and that you could value it on DCF models or discounted cash flow models. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about why you're so bullish on Ethereum? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if you go into, um, if you go into the details and you look at which blockchains are actually making money, there's not many, right? Maybe let's say there's 10,000 crypto tokens, most of which are built on Ethereum. Let's say there's 400 blockchains. Um, I think two make money, one of which is Ethereum. Um, it makes um, 400 million quid a month in transaction fees. And um, it, uh, in order to get those users in and to pay those transaction fees, it has to put out 200 million a month in uh, token incentives. So that's issuing new Ethereum. 
to the people who support the network and keep all the transactions neatly organized and stuff. So it was 50% profit margin, which is pretty good. Um, and I think that to me, it just feels like a new kind of technology stock. You know, it was the first, uh, it was actually faster to meta to um, $10 billion of revenue. Um, it's faster than VMware, faster than Zoom by quite a long way. Um, so to me, it's just, it's literally a case of like this blockchain makes money. Um, and I think it's got the most daily active users. Uh, if we want to talk about average revenue per user is $60 for Ethereum. Uh, for Solana, which is Ethereum's biggest rival, it's $1. Um, for Cardano, it's maybe only 50 cents. Uh, but you can go in and look at the data. Um, there's a great website called Token Terminal, not affiliated with it, but um, that's starting to look at things like price to fees, price to sales, how much revenue it brings in, you know, price to earnings. So you can kind of apply these traditional financial metrics to a blockchain, not to a token because they're different things. Um, and it's that's really it. It's just logic. Yeah, could you... So if we look at those revenues and we say that the two big things that I would associate with Ethereum are ICOs and uh, NFTs, okay. which would... One of the two, I would call a load of crap, <laughs> personally. Um, I know people like NFTs and digital art and all that, but I'd say the last iteration was more about people making a load of money than it was about providing 100%. any. What do you think are some more exciting applications of that technology in the future or now that, that could justify the value and not be just seen as mm. a bit scammy? Yeah, I Even mean- Even ICOs the, were scammy. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, it, it's a new business model and people rushed in and they didn't really yeah. know what they were buying. I mean, I would classify the whole crypto market into three things. One, Bitcoin, scarcity, digital gold. Two, Ethereum, programming languages and uh, App Store. And three is everything else. So Bitcoin is 50% of the market. What are we at now? It's like 2.75 trillion. 50% of that, that is Bitcoin. Another 20% of that is Ethereum. So that's already 70% of the entire market in the top two, the two things that actually do things. And then the other 30% is everything else. If you look at the top 10 projects or coins, let's say you've got um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you've got a stable coin that runs on Ethereum. So that's like just a um, US dollar USDT. stable. USDT. USDC is another... Uh, is another one in the top 10. And then you've got Ethereum clone, Solana. You've got Cardano clone, in my opinion, Solana. Uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Ethereum clone, in my opinion, Cardano. You've got a Ripple, bullshit. Um, and then- yeah. <laughs> All the people who are XRP bag holders are going to be upset I'm going to get now. absolutely slayed. You are. The comments are like, but I've I don't got care. XRP. Man, it's a crypto chain. You're going to get slayed by everyone all over the 100%. place. 100%. It's, it's okay. Don't worry. 100%. It's a safe place. <laughs> we don't want to tell them where you live. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got two stupid dog coins, meme coins, you know. That That's what I'm about. <laughs> <laughs> bit, of, yeah. bit of doge. Bit of doge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the you've got um, two stable coins that run on Ethereum about $130 billion worth. You've got Ethereum itself, you've got Bitcoin, and then you've got four Ethereum clones and two stupid dog coins, which also run on Ethereum. So what does that tell you? Like all the innovation is leaning towards Ethereum, right? Or Bitcoin, if you want digital gold and you want to go and live in a bunker, you know, that's just how I see it. So it's, it's Betamax VHS. It's kind of like, you know, the emergence out of the tech bubble. No one could call it. And it's like, oh yeah, if you bought Amazon and Microsoft, it's like, yeah, but you could have bought Cisco or something else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Why Ethereum? I mean, it's the second largest by market cap. It's the most stable. It's been going for, uh, I mean, he came, Vitalik came up with the idea in about 2013 out of an industry that's 15 years old. You know, it's quite a long time, right? You know, one of the, major things that could be really popular and really valuable in future is tokenization of real world assets. Mm. So you think about any kind of real world asset, what's an asset like a, um, like a mortgage deed, for example, like, um, so property deeds is something that like, you know, proves personal ownership of something. Um, tokenizing that would be to, um, split it up into different pieces, pop it on a blockchain, and then that represents the value of that um, mortgage um, of that mortgage deed. Um, and so if you wanted then to get access to that mortgage deed, or if you wanted to buy a house, then you just um, make your transaction. Um, and it would be as simple as, you know, could happen within a couple of minutes rather than having to go through like, you know, huge amounts of paperwork, uh, lots, of, lots of middlemen, lots of intermediaries, and uh, lots of additional cost. But it's a case of whether people want to launch it on a public blockchain like Ethereum, where you can seal the code and you can literally just copy paste it and make your own blockchain. 
it, which won't be as secure and stable because you haven't got the developers or to keep it up to date or whatever. Or is it banks? You look at like JP Morgan now, uh, you know, 2017, J- uh, Jamie Dimon says Bitcoin is like tulips, worse than fraud. It's, it's awful. Yeah. It's total uh, dog mess. Um, and, you know, now they've built their own blockchain called Onyx. And they're going heavily into tokenization of real world assets, you know, tokenization of commercial bank money. Um, I just think that that is probably where a lot of real world assets are going to be represented on chain. But is it going to be Ethereum or is it going to be banks? It might be banks. They might be sweeter with the regulator, which might give them a bit of a leg up or whatever. Mm. But yeah, okay. So as an investor then in Ethereum, (laughs) so I can understand the investment proposition of a Bitcoin because it's scarce. So they're, they're never going to be more. But you just openly admitted that they essentially create supply to pay out you know, there's there's rewards paid and they're creating or minting new Ethereum. And it seems like there isn't that level of scarcity there. So as an investor, well, where is where is that promise? I think that, okay, so in 2022, um, mm. Ethereum in the London hard fork uh, introduced something called fee burn. Yeah. So um, it is actually burning more tokens than it issues currently. So it is actually, it's deflationary versus Bitcoin supply, which is disinflationary. So it's going up but at a slower rate the whole time. So there is, I do see some store of value in a currency, which is sort of like the supply is falling slowly over time. That's one thing. It's almost like a buyback within a, within a stock. 100%. Just removing, removing off the market. 100%. Basically. And the more- From the cash um, flows that it generates, it's, it's removing its own supply. Exactly right. Yeah. Can you guess what the biggest learning has been from doing this podcast or even my YouTube channel? It's that the most important investment you can make is in you. So for me, my path to real wealth isn't through investing, it's by building this business. And that's why I'm happy that we're working with Hostinger. Hostinger help entrepreneurs, freelancers, and side hustlers with their websites. My favorite thing is their AI website builder, which helps anyone create a professional website with zero coding experience. You just describe your goal in a couple of sentences and the AI creates a beautiful looking website, just like magic. You can then customize it, use the AI assistant to generate SEO friendly text, and even use their AI logo maker. It's fast, user friendly, and of course, what I like the best is it's great value for money. You can get website hosting in a free domain from £2.99 a month. So if you want a website, then check out Hostinger. And if you use the code making money, that's making money all one word, you'll get 10% off. And I've left a link in the description for you. So, okay, then let's now talk about this within. You're clearly into Ethereum. This guy's into whatever he can get his hands on. <laughs> I've got a bit of Bitcoin, bit of Ethereum, okay. n- nothing much. My price, my average price for Bitcoin was seven and a half thousand, which I'm pretty proud of. Tidy. Yeah, it's not Tidy. bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. That's uh, not bad, I, actually. But I also bought at the all-time high the other day because... Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I, so I DCA into it. So just to be clear, like so, a dollar or a pound cost average, I buy a little bit every month. It represents about 10% of my portfolio at the minute because mm-hmm. it's doing well, but it, it probably takes up about 5% of what I invest every month. Mm-hmm. So I buy every month regardless. And but do you I, do you on. rebalance that? So like, do you, do you have like a set limit for... Mm-hmm how much crypto should be a part of your overall no. portfolio and then you sell it when it gets up to that limit. I understand that logic of like, you know, um, it, it represents a portion. But for me, I just think it's like a schmuck insurance. It's, I don't want to be here in 20, 30 years and my son go like, oh, I'm buying this, I buy things with Bitcoin or whatever. And I'm like, I, I just missed that. I had exactly the same thought. I <laughs> thought, you know, like, because I don't own any Bitcoin. Hmm. I sold it all for Ethereum about five years ago. Um but I just think that like exactly the same. I don't have kids, but if I did and they turned around to me and said, dad, weren't you there? Like when Bitcoin was invented, Yeah. like the first asset to create digital scarcity and you still didn't buy any, yeah. they'd be pretty upset, my yeah. descendants. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's, this is exactly my view. And, and I can see, I, I can agree that it's scarce. I can agree. We had a, a guy on, which is going to be the next episode. Mm-hmm. And he spoke about how, um, people said it was a good inflation hedge. And then basically he said that he didn't agree with that. But actually, if you look at it versus inflation since mm-hmm. its inception, it's the best performing asset class over 15 years. Yeah. So it is the best inflation hedge we've got. Over, that, the, over the long term. Yeah, but yeah. I only yeah. view inflation hedges over long term. I'm a long term investor. Yeah. I, view, I view inflation and market returns over the long term. Yeah. You know, anyway. So I, I have that allocation, but I also think like, I have that question in the back of my head of when would I sell this thing, right? Or like, you know, if I would. Mm-hmm. And the answer is it'd probably need to hit a million a coin before 
it's worth me selling. Mm -hmm. So I just DCA until that point and it's yeah. either going to change my life or it's, or it's not, you know. Yeah, but then, you, you know, you're not introducing a massive amount of risk no. to your life, you know, That's because you don't want to be trading something. I mean, I don't trade anyway because I've lost too much money trading a long time ago. Um, but you don't want to be doing something that introduces massive amounts of risk, additional risk and additional stress to your life. Because nobody wants that, man. No. You know, you've got other things to think about. You've got work, you've got to pick the kids up, you've got to watch the football late, you've got to see your mates, have some human connection. People who get into crypto trading just fall down the rabbit hole. I just see it, you know, I'm, I can't, I cannot tell you the number of people who talk to me and say, because they know I'm a financial analyst, I work in crypto. They say, Tom, what do you think about this coin, that coin, this coin? It's like, it's usually something, it's almost always something I've never heard yeah. of. Because you cannot be an expert in in everything. I consider myself, a, I know a little bit about Ethereum. I've been researching it for quite a long time. I know a little bit about Bitcoin. I don't really know anything about the others because it takes so long to get into and to research. Like Bonk coin, Whiff coin, Meme coin, Pepe coin. And I always ask them, what does it do? How does it make money? And they're like, what do you mean? Line goes up. That is exactly my experience. I mean, Damo's um, approach to investing in crypto is very like sensible long term. But for people okay. I've always, yeah, this guy. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> but I've um obviously I worked in the crypto industry. I worked for mm. a couple of exchanges. I run a crypto fund for like friends and family. Uh -huh. How how much of your portfolio is in crypto? Uh, about eighty percent. I'd say half of that is Ethereum, probably like twenty five percent Bitcoin, and then I've got like actually probably my thirty percent Bitcoin. And I've got Solana, Matic, um, and a few others. I think I have some, I've got so, lots of Cardano, lots of Cardano because it's a low, low cap gem. Um, and then, yeah, I've got a little bit of Dogecoin, which I'm just holding just in case it's a sky skyrock. But that's just, that's like, that's for fun. That's not a serious investment. I mean, I'm talking like under, under 400 pounds worth of Dogecoins, just in case it goes crazy and just in know, case. turns into like 10 grand. I'd be like, oh, well. A little, I can afford to lose the Dogecoin. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. You keep telling yourself this, mate. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a difference between like putting money in and being able to, you're thinking like you, it's, it's money I can lose and then losing it. Yeah. Totally yeah. different thing. Oh, definitely. Yeah. What about yourself? What, what's your portfolio look like? Um, I'm about 25% crypto and it's all in Ethereum. Okay. And 75%. Um, like I Sarah. own Fidelity All World. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, you know, awesome. I own a biotech fund, um, and then I own yeah six stocks. Two, one of which is Coinbase, and then healthcare, um, renewable energy, um, and that's about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, you got the global portfolio just in case everything else goes wrong. That's my end of the world insurance. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like the the world is going to continue, yeah, right? Yeah. The world keeps spinning, and yeah, that's that's it. So I at one point had like twenty five coins. And even though I was working in the street, like you said, it's impossible to do research on all of them. So now I've downsized to about eight mm -hmm. and I know them all fairly well. And yep. unlike Damo, I do like when Bitcoin went up, I sold a little bit. Nice. And then when it goes back down, I'll buy a bit more. Love I do it. buy every month, but when the market's down, I buy more. And when it's up, I start selling because last time I didn't sell enough. And yep. then the market crashed and I just had to hold on for three, four years Nobody until now. Does. And now it's back up. I'm not doing the same mistake again. So I'm like, I'll take some profit yep. when it crashes, buy some more. When it goes up, take some profit. And that's, so every level it goes up, I take a little bit of profit. Do you think I there think. will be a crash again? Yep. It's 100%. inevitable. Yeah, 100, yeah, 100%. It's inevitable. Yeah. So it seems to move up in these sort of, um, it's all kind of based around the Bitcoin halving. This yeah, is kind yeah. of like a narrative people got a hold of. The scarcity, the scarcity dramatically increases every four years, um, Bitcoin. Um, so the average uh, bear market in crypto lasts 585 days. Um, the average bull market is about 385 days. Um, I've got some charts on charting futures. Come have a look at them. Um, plan B does some good analysis on this as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you know Plan B? For um, the stock to flow model. Oh, stock to flow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, like, he's the guy who made that famous. But yeah, carry on, sorry. You um, yeah, so I, I would say that, I mean, you can't predict it to the day because if anyone could time the market, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be, you know, sitting on the beach in Bali, like drinking cognac because we'd be, you know, be billionaires. But so like no one knows the future and no one can time the market. Um, but looking back at what has happened, I think that there's an, in, an inevitable massive swell up. And you look at the any sort of like new technology, like this weird thing called the internet, you know, there was a massive run up, mm -hmm. and there was a massive crash on the other side. And some people thought, well, that's the end of that then. But it wasn't. 
Um, and it tends to happen with all new technologies, really. So I think it's just worth paying attention. But that happened once with the internet, the dot-com bubble, really. And maybe there's been like little bubbles throughout that, tech bubbles, Magnificent Seven recently, these kind of things. <laughs> 30% of them, yeah. yeah, yeah but, you know. but with Bitcoin, so there's this predictability around the halving, which is this idea that it's got built into it that the, the, the supply the miners can pull out of the ecosystem or the, the blockchain halves every four-ish years or whatever. It, the, when does that get priced in? It's to the point of now that we have massive institutional adoption, we have mm. ETFs in America and we have a lot of money in there. Yep. We can see that if you track the halving, so how much does Bitcoin go up after each of these periods? It diminishes each time. Yeah. So 15 times, seven times, three times, one day it's not going to drop. Yeah. And what I'm saying, you know, people go, the crash is inevitable. And I'm sitting here now and people mm. are going, it's going to go crazy after the halving. Maybe it's priced in and in the stock market if we learn from the mm. stock market. And I think what crypto investors fail to do is learn from the stock market because yeah. it's- All learned from history. Yeah. yeah, like what I'm saying is there's an asset class there that's basically done everything that crypto has done mm. in you know these wild swings and all of the pump and dumps and all of the stuff that yeah. was regulated out of it. It it tends to calm down over time. Yeah. And yeah. you know, how much of that how could I that think be possible? Like, I mean, with the introduction of Bitcoin ETFs, I mm. reckon Bitcoin volatility will fall yeah. dramatically. Okay. If you look at gold volatility before there were gold ETFs, gold volatility was about so volatility is like how much an asset price tends to move around its mean, mm. around its average. Um I think that the volatility of Bitcoin prices will drop with the introduction of um, the ETFs. But I think, you know, if you look at it, it's been dropping steadily over time since Bitcoin got a reference rate in 2016. So a reference rate is a single source of truth price um, that someone can point to and say- So it's the that, same everywhere in the world. That's the, point, that's the price yeah. of Bitcoin. You know, it's not 3.56799, you know, it's like exactly three or whatever. Um, and that's, you know, six years ago. I think it's taken a little bit more time than I expected for Bitcoin's volatility, volatility to calm down. Um, Thank God. Because <laughs> I don't want it to calm down. Get, bring on another little crash. I'll load up a bit more. Like, I mean, you know. it does follow a logarithmic curve, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this as is you say, like six times after the first, sorry, 10 times after the first halving, six times after the next halving, four times after the next one after that. Yeah, it'll get to a point where there's so much money sloshing around in it and if, if if there is that much trust that it won't move down dramatically because people have been like, we've been here so many times, mm. you know, we know. And and if it's going onto balance sheets of businesses and stuff, they're not going to go, can be held. we'll see you later, like every time it drops 5%. I mean, there's so much regulatory stuff to do around Bitcoin. Like, can banks hold it? Okay, so for the biggest custodian bank in the world, Bank of New York Mellon, um, started custodying Bitcoin in like 2020. So it's not very long ago, you know, and people like, you know, you can't have uh, in this country, like pr even professional investors haven't been able to invest in like single asset ETPs, which are like exchange traded product. So that's just a um, an asset that trades on a national stock exchange, like the Deutsche Börse in Germany or London Stock Exchange in, in London. So the, the access to this asset has just not been there, you know, for the average institution or the average professional investor or even high net worth investors. But like 80% of high net worth investors want to hold crypto through a financial institution because they're not unshaven, like Reddit obsessed cyberpunks, you know. And they don't trust exchanges and... They don't trust exchanges. And I, even don't the trust, trust, and I don't trust many exchanges. And the concept of them putting on Ledger, like it's so foreign yeah, to them. Wants, if they've got to... millions in, like with advisors and in banks, they're like, why do I want to carry like all this money on a little It's like having drive. your wages in, in under your mattress, isn't it? It's that yeah, kind of- Yeah, I mean, and I don't want to be my own bank because mm. I'm stupid. Yeah. And like my dog would eat, would eat it or like it'd fall down the side of the sofa or and like lose I'd lose it. And it's like, oh, there's 30 grand. Well, where's it gone? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. like, I, like, that was the promise of crypto. It's like self-sovereignty self -sovereignty of assets. But like most people see that as like a bug and not a feature. You know. Yeah, the banking system is useful in a lot of ways. It is, you know, you know and we, we outsource and, that risk to mm, them. We outsource mm. that, you know. It um, gives you a lot of peace of mind in the sense of... You don't have to think of it, but you might be getting screwed over. Yeah, but no. imagine the days when you carried a gold, bag of gold coins on your waist and every highwayman was just jumping up and robbing you constantly. <laughs> like that, that, the banking system removed that. And yeah, they're, they're highwaymen and they're robbing you in a different kind of way. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Um, and I know that the system is not perfect, but mm -hmm. it's certainly removed a lot of stress around, will my money be there tomorrow? But, yeah. 
So let's talk. I think the most interesting, the conversation I want to have with you today in, in the most detail is you get people that are like all in crypto. It's going to change the world. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to, it. you know, if you're not in it, you're an idiot. Enjoy being poor when Lambo. And then on the <laughs> other end of it, you've got like stupid kids don't know what they're on about. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's, some, yeah, okay. it's tulips, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, sorry. I don't mean to be ageist. Okay? <laughs> I'm just talking about the people in my comments. This is, this is just general reflection. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in is the person in the middle mm -hmm. that's like, hmm, I'm not really sure. I, it looks okay. Like maybe I'd like a little bit. So can you just, first of all, give us a background on your history around the ETC market, was it that you were in? Yeah, sure. So I was, for the last three years, I was head of research at uh, ETC Group, which is, um, they run the largest Bitcoin fund in, in Europe. So that's about 1.5 billion of assets under management there. Um, I'm out of there now and I'm doing my own thing writing. But while I was there, I was uh, researching um, what is the effect of a small amount of Bitcoin and a small amount of Ethereum in a classic 60-40 portfolio. So a classic portfolio would be 60% equities, stocks and shares, and 40% government bonds, 60-40. And if you take 2% out of the stocks and shares and 2% out of the bonds, then what you find is with either Bitcoin or Ethereum, your returns are effectively doubled over the last seven years. Yeah, you, uh, you, I know you. I know that was private research, but you linked some other research and it That's showed right, from 7% yeah. to 14. And if you had Ethereum, it was like 16%. Or correct. Maybe. Yeah, correct. Which is a significant jump over a lifetime. That's going to make, that's millions of pounds. <laughs> exactly yeah. that, exactly yeah. that. And um, you're not even suffering max like a huge amount of drawdown so i mean i see max drawdown as just max pain like you don't want to turn around one day and think you've got 100 grand in the bank and because you've over invested in a risky asset class now it's like 43 it's like oh dear yeah the amount the, when you say max drawdown you mean the amount of volatility or the amount of yeah, swings the amount, the amount that you could log on one day and, and how much it's dropped and i think what people do is they look at bitcoin and go it drops 70 percent in a day i don't mm -hmm. want that yeah. what they don't realize is 70 percent of one percent of your portfolio is what you're basically saying. Exactly that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's just about, I mean, let's say, I mean, professional investors do not buy single things. They allocate to asset classes. And I mean, I don't know the last time an asset class was created, but it wasn't certainly wasn't in my lifetime. Um, and so I think you just have to, even if you don't believe in it, is going up. It has belief, it has faith, you know. Um, I think you would be wise to probably allocate a very small percentage of your overall portfolio to Bitcoin or Ethereum. So just just to flesh that out, let's say, what was the percentage you said there? Um, 4%. So 2% so of each. 2%, so if you had yeah. a million quid, you'd put 20 grand into Bitcoin, 20 grand into Ethereum. Correct. You'd still have 960,000 pounds in Stocks and bonds. Yeah. And that would have doubled your returns over the last 10 to 15 in years. In that little bracket. There. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty crazy, right? It's right. not bad. But then, you know, you, you if if it does crash to nothing, then what? You've lost yeah, you've 20 lost, grand. Yeah, you've lost n not- I mean, not for enough. me, it's like, you know, 100 grand, I'll put two grand in Ethereum, two grand in Bitcoin, you know? Yeah. 100 grand, I'll put like 50 grand in Ethereum, 50 grand <laughs> in Bitcoin. <laughs> Just like my mate, and I want to talk to Sean. Sean, you're trading- Take some profits, please. Please take some profits. Yes, take some profits. Shout out, what's your mate? What's oh, your, your brother who watches brother, this show. My brother-in-law, Ian. Oh, yeah. yeah. Shout yeah. out, Ian. Shout out, Ian. Thanks for show. watching. Keep watching. Yeah, Buy yeah. It. Does he um, invest in crypto as well? Or No. <laughs> It's been cornered by me too many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? It you is know. because you get obsessed by this man. <clears throat> but it's like, I'm a nerd, you're a nerd. For some people, it's Star For Ian, it's Star Wars. For me, it's Star Trek and crypto. For my yeah, little- Mike, June. I'm obsessed with June at the minute. <laughs> Amazing. Why do you think people in crypto are so passionate? Because mine's basketball and crypto and I will talk to anyone about, I'll go, I'm that guy at the parties and everyone's having a good time. I'm like, yeah. guys, are you invested in Ethereum? And I'm like, I'll go off and I'll, and I'll always find some person who'll talk to me. But like, why are crypto people so enthusiastic? Um, I mean, for one thing, it's, as I said before, it's a weird smashing together of lots of really complex technologies. And if you love maths or you love like, you know, I mean, I will never be a cryptographer because I've got another 50 years to do a P like 10 PhDs to figure out how it works. But like, it's intricate detail. For some people, you know, they've seen, they've seen other friends of theirs who are not any smarter than them, like get stupid rich, mm -hmm. you know? But to me, if you're- Lucky though. 100%. And, and luck 100%. doesn't mean it's something's a good investment, right? No, it absolutely doesn't. And also, like, I think if you are buying meme coins at any point, 
you know, you don't need me to tell you what to buy. You need like counseling for your gambling addiction. Yeah. You know? You seen that guy who's like, he's like a, he's one of the red pill kind of people. And he, 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 he controlled 1% of pancake swaps whole like tra supply mm -hmm. like the whole supply of pancake swap when it was 20 million mm -hmm. and it shot up to 2 billion mm -hmm. so the guy made a shitload of cash really quick and now he sits there telling everyone how to get rich and I'm like you're a degenerate gambler mate you, yeah. put, you, you put 2 million quid into yeah. pancake swap <laughs> like you, you rolled the dice it's like someone walking out of a casino going I just landed I put a million quid on 27 and that's just landed now I know how to gamble yeah. it's that kind yeah, of yeah that's right and you might get lucky you know mm. but you might also survivorship bias you might put your life savings into something that you don't understand. If you don't understand crypto, don't buy it. Why would you invest in something you don't understand? Mm. Like you don't have any idea what it does and you don't know if it makes any money and it probably doesn't. Mm -hmm. Like I will, okay, so I own, others, other than Ethereum, I own six stocks and I do about two, 18 months of, or to two years worth of research um, in the background. Because if it's not, you know, I'm going to miss like the early bloom of it, but like if it's not there after two years, I don't want to own it, you know, because I'm trying to think about 20 year investments, 30 year investments. But like that's the level of research I think you need to, to go into a single asset, especially if it's going to be a significant part of your portfolio. Would you call one to 2% significant or could someone just pick that up as like a broad? I would say, I mean, it depends upon your risk appetite. Um, some people have to be a bit more adventurous. Uh, some people are young and, you know, they've got time on their side. They can be a bit more adventurous than if you're sort of approaching retirement. I probably, you know, probably wouldn't. Um, I would say f for the average investor, one, three, five percent would be the max. So you said you did this research, four percent holding to, to crypto produced, yeah. you know, almost a doubling in the returns of mm -hmm. a 60, 40 portfolio, but you, you have 25% exposure mm -hmm. to just Ethereum. Yeah. Why don't you follow the research? Um, I'm more of a conviction investor uh, than that. I mean, the, the research is for kind of like the average professional who maybe doesn't know a lot about crypto and is not willing to tolerate the kind of volatility that having more than 4% um, out of their 60, 40 portfolio. I mean, I don't own any government bonds because I don't believe that, you know, that's a risk-free investment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more a conviction investor in Ethereum, me personally. It does introduce much more risk and much more volatility to my portfolio, but I'm willing to contain that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't see volatility as risk in my, in my eyes. I just see it's part of the ride, you mm. know, risk and reward. Okay, so I've got another question. It's just a selfish one. Sure. How, what's your exit like? ladder look like in terms of selling on, along the way? Um, I mean, I try and keep it at that max 25% level. You know, I try and sell it down to 20. Like I just ba basically take profits on the way up um, and um, DCA back in on the way down. Beautiful. Yeah, it, it's horrible though when you when you cut, say you take 5% out and then it doubles it's in awful. price. Oh, it's yeah. awful. Like, Jesus, what you have feel like you're taking, you're stealing profits yeah, from your yeah. future self. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But I mean, I, but it, trust me, it feels much worse when you lose 80% of your value in your you, portfolio. You'll never, it feels you'll never much forget worse. the day I don't. when like it went up to a hundred grand from like a quid yeah. and then you never sold and it went back down to a pound because yeah. you've been shoving it in everyone's faces yeah. the whole time saying, I'm a genius, I'm going to be a millionaire. And now what are you? The worst thing I had a whole, a whole like six to eight months to sell, didn't sell. So obviously sold a little bit, went on holiday, bought a bit, but didn't sell like the bag. And yeah. just held it till now. When I was working full time, there was this lad who was like an admin and he was probably on like 20 grand a year and he bought a load of NFTs for like a few quid and each went to 12 grand. Yeah. So he had like 10 of these things. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm just going to hold them because I'm going to be rich. I was like, mate, you have won. Sell. You have done the thing. You went from a quid to 12 grand. Yeah. Like that is the movement. People and it's surprising to yeah. me that people like 100x something and go, oh, I'm, I'm not rich yet. <laughs> it's like you, you've done <laughs> the to thing. Be, to be honest, man, it's not surprising to me because again, mm. that's human OS, mm. right? You get something that you think is going to make you rich. You get rich and then you want more. Mm. And you're thinking, well, I'm not going to just pay off my mortgage. I'll pay off my mum's mortgage. Yeah. You know, like I want to be able to help my future generations and help my brother out and help my sister out. Do you know what I mean? It's not a surprise to me, but if you do get there, please take some profit. Yeah. Yeah. But don't invest in altcoins. It's not an investment, it's gambling, but mm. my opinion. So, the, you know, the, the research focuses on, it's called a sharp ratio, isn't it? That's the, correct. The, this yeah. is this idea of 
what can you introduce to a portfolio that in, it produces return without increasing the risk too much? That's right. And this is this point around, and I think this is who I want to speak to, the normal person sitting there going, should I buy this? This one to 2% might just juice your portfolio a bit. Mm. But now we're sitting at all time highs, mm -hmm. you know? And for those people, what's the best way for them to buy? If they go, yeah, okay, one, 2%, I'll get my head around that. Mm -hmm. I'll build it up so I've got a few grand in, in whatever. When do I buy it? Do I wait now to the crash? Do I buy it every month? Do I? I mean, my, I'm not giving you financial advice because I'm not a financial advisor. Please do. <laughs> That's what we're here for. We'll turn into a We keep this. asking everyone and no one's giving it us. We're going to sit here. The SWAT someone. team from the FCA is going to break down yeah, our door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I would DCA. Yeah. I would buy, a, I would put, if you want to buy some crypto and I think, um, you know, the, the London Stock Exchange has just, maybe in the last couple of days, said that you now can buy these uh, single asset ETPs in Bitcoin and Ethereum. I don't know when they're going to list them yet, but that's going to trade on the main market, I think, maybe by Q3. It's going to be like dominoes, like aren't they, around the world? Now they've seen all the inflows into the ETFs in America and the amount of money I mean, they're the making. the ETF inflows outpaced gold inflows. So so these are the records that gold used to hold. Yeah. So the, the dollar cost average then is just, I buy a bit every month. It's the same. I mean, anyone listening to this is probably doing the same with an index fund, a global index fund. So 100%. you're just saying, okay, a few quid, I'll do that. But how do they do that? in a safe way, because first of all, exchanges are dodgy as hell and they're expensive. And in the UK, we can't yet buy these ETFs or not easily. You might be able to backdoor it into America somehow, but. Yeah, I mean, I personally, I buy on Coinbase. Yes, I, buy I was going to say it, but I didn't want to shout them out. That's what, no, that's what I you do. Know, I that's also, what I've always well, done. Like, full disclaimer, I also own stock in Coinbase. Okay. okay. Oh. But yeah. But I've always bought Coinbase because I just thought better, the safest, most real. They're the ones that I trust. <laughs> and I know I get shouted at by one section of, by not holding my own keys, you know, not your keys, not your coins, but I'm lazy. You know. Do you do it in a Coinbase wallet? Yeah. you got Coinbase Wallet. How yeah. safe do you think a Coinbase Wallet is? So just to for people to understand, there's Coinbase Exchange and then there's Coinbase Wallet, mm -hmm. which is, they don't hold the keys to that, but it's on your phone, right? Yeah. Um, how secure do I think it is? I mean, it's relatively secure. Um, I can't speak to the security of it, to be honest with you. But uh, Do you know a $5 yeah. wrench attack? You heard of that? No. A $5 wrench attack is where someone hits you over the head with a wrench until you give them your crypto. <laughs> so this is so the only reason I say this is because my mate, um, he's a doctor yeah. and he's got another mate who's a doctor. Um, funny that. So they, they, he said he was walking around London at night and some, and four like lads jumped him and he could get your phone out and they were punching him in the face. He put his phone to his face, went on, went on to his Coinbase wallet, flung all the crypto out of it. So this is the kind of, this is in terms of safety, this is what I'm thinking about. For the record, I have no crypto. Do not come. <laughs> I don't have a phone. I don't have a phone. I have no crypto. I have no ledgers. I've got no. I'm not happy for Bitcoin conversations. I do not know anything about crypto. So, but, um, so yeah. I think about this often in terms of yeah. you know laziness and, and yeah, that's true. I mean, look, you know, it's something that we all tend towards. Like, even people who've been in crypto for a long time they don't self-custody. Mm. Like I was thinking in the FTX crash, like I think Larry Cermak, who's the head of research at the block, he had quite a lot of money in there and quite a lot of, um, you know, respectable sort of like people who are follow, like also had quite a lot of money just held on the exchange. Um, it's just costly should, to should it. I take some out, stick it on a pen drive and stick it in a safe somewhere along with like, you know, property deeds and a 45 handgun, maybe. <laughs> I, that's, I dream of that. Yeah. I've told you this before. I want, yeah. you know, gold bars, a few different dossiers, moleskin, and then just some like... <laughs> research, some, deep yeah, research. Yeah, 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 that's, just what in case. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Scarce value currency. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you can yeah, use yeah. in the end of the world, man. Yeah. End of the world insurance. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, but like, a, no, seriously, safe mm. deposit box maybe with insurance. Mm -hmm. But then how does the insurance work if this thing's doubling every few years in price? Yeah, and do you trust the insurer? Yeah. No. You know, they, do they have the... Yeah, are they the gate to you getting your keys? Are they the gate to get to you getting your value stuff, yeah. you know, in the future? Right. I'm just watching this back and I'm not really happy with how the conversation around exchanges here has framed the risks. I just want to be crystal clear that there is plenty of risk with carrying or storing your crypto on an exchange. They do go down. They have gone down. FTX is a prime example of that. And they don't have the same levels of protections that you would get in a bank. For example, the financial services compensation scheme. So... You know, think hard about where you want to store your crypto. The guest here is saying, you know, I, I'm lazy with it and I know I understand the risks. Just just do some research and think about it because, you know, exchanges aren't perfect, but neither are hardware wallets either. Um, you know, there's risks there as well. 
So again, this space is fraught with risk. And the main point is there isn't any protection to cover your butt if things go wrong. So yeah, let's get back on with the episode. The ETF oh. are good, aren't they, in a way? Yeah. That you can wrap them in a tax advantage account. You and, can stick and, them and, in an ISA, man. It's, please, it's funny that put going, it in an ISA, please. Like. Yeah, but it's, you, you know, I've seen you talk about the ISA stuff mm. and they're basically saying that you might not even be able to hold fractional shares inside of an ISA at the minute, yeah. let alone Bitcoin. I mean, the thing is like, the UK is trying to put itself forward as a crypto hub and yet it's just not regulated fast it's enough. So oh, it's so behind. It's so behind. I mean, the, okay, so maybe there might be a bit of something good coming in future with, I think there's a couple of pressure groups, a couple of lobby groups are now starting to get the message that like, this is might be an important technology and people want to hold it. So maybe you should try and regulate so people can hold it in the safest and most tax advantage way, please. Um, I think your but, points around the innovative finance ISA were good in terms of you, that's where it should sit. It, stocks and shares ISA, I mean, it could sit within stocks and shares if it's an, you know, an ETF in, and you could tradable on a broker. Mm -hmm. That's great. But I can see why the regulator would be like, it's not native to an ISA this. It's not It's not stocks and shares. It's not bonds. Mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't automatically get That's one get of the things, in. isn't it? It's like, yeah. where does this asset yeah. class, is it an asset class? Where does it sit? It's not, is it currency? Well, sometimes it is, but on other blockchains it isn't. It's just like an incentive mechanism. Is it equity? Sometimes it is, but it's not really. Is, is it, it, is it commodity? Yeah. You know, yeah. sometimes it is, but it's not really like, you know, and it's not debt, is it? So what is it? It's not... A lot of crypto and a lot of they just don't sit in the in the, an easy to understand bucket for a lot of people. So I understand what you're saying. And there. like you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum versus the governance protocol OMH or whatever. Like they're very different things, and it's <laughs> it's not you know it's not. You can't just say, oh, crypto in an ISA, but you can't just also say, oh, just Bitcoin in an ISA. Yeah, you know I, I mean, mean, to be honest with you, I wouldn't even put, I don't think, you know, there could be so many categories for it. You know, I don't see Bitcoin and Ethereum even in the same asset class, really. No. Like, you know. Well, exactly. So then you've, you've got a whole load of rules that are going to need mm. to come in place. And just from a perspective of a government, again, mm -hmm. if you're saying this thing's going to, you know, keep going up in price for a long time, well, then that's a good place to generate a lot of tax revenue from capital gains. So Absolutely. probably we'll wait until that's happened before we allow you to tax wrap it. I, will, I want to say one thing on where to buy and store your crypto, because mm -hmm. we were saying Coinbase is really good and I agree it's really good, but my friend had all his all his crypto savings in FTX, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, everything, like thousands mm -hmm. he'd been building over years, yeah. lost it all. Yeah. So. Even though Coinbase is kind of like the blue chip. It's good until it isn't. It's good until, like no one thought, I was about to buy some FTX, um, but mm -hmm. until it crashes, it's the blue chip standard. So although Coinbase is really good, I have some on Coinbase, some on Binance, and then some on a ledger, and then some on like mm -hmm. other crypto exchanges. So that yeah. the chances of all six exchanges and me losing my ledger. I like or, that redundancy. And man. some in Revolut because Revolut let you buy crypto. So I've got some in my Revolut. So at least that one's kind of the safest because it's in my bank. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, it's better to risk to put it on a couple of exchanges. Once you get over like a few thousand pounds worth of crypto, you don't want to have it all in on one exchange, even if it's Coinbase, which is the best. They could that disappear. Is, that is right for people like me and you who maybe own, you know, maybe a little bit overexposed to crypto yeah. at large. But like for the average person, it will be, hopefully yeah. they will buy it, you know, as an ETP, if they can. Yeah, you know? yeah, get it and get it an ETF or an ETP. And then you know that... There's none of there's none of that drama. Yeah. I, I personally, I'm going to get hated for this. I wouldn't touch Binance. I don't trust that thing at all. No. The way it's domiciled, the Same. way it positions itself, the the, the owners tax agree. dodgy as hell. Like, you, why do you base yourself offshore? You mm. know, I, I want companies that face into regulation and say, "We're right here. You can come and look." Yeah, um, it, Binance do not do that. Yeah, trust so, good at every opportunity. But they have yeah. a huge selection of coins, which is yeah, why right. I got into them. Did they even when I was a degenerate and I was just buying lots of different coins? But now, mm. yeah, you don't. But like you said, you pay three fifty and you list. Like you pay three hundred fifty thousand and they'll plonk you on the exchange. They, yeah. they, whereas Coinbase seem to be a bit more selective. Yeah. So I mean that's true. But I mean Binance just had such a massive um, advantage because it would list anything. Yeah. Mm. You know, it would list anything. Like with maybe not doing the. KYC, like know your customer, yeah, yeah. anti-money laundering checks that it probably should have. Definitely. I don't really trust Binance to be honest. And a lot of exchanges do that. Like I worked at one in Singapore, like worked mm -hmm. at a couple and a lot not of them, OKX, they kind of it? bypass, no, no not OKX. Yeah. Um, Coinstore, I worked in oh, Singapore, okay. really good exchange. Awesome. Um, but I worked at other exchanges that weren't quite as reputable. Mm -hmm. And essentially they, they kind of, 
they skip, like you said, a lot of uh, KYC, know your customer. They say, we don't accept money from these countries, but then if someone offers you enough, they tend to accept it. So it's kind of like very gray area for the exchanges. So mm-hmm. I, I agree. I also wouldn't really trust many of them um, very much. because they were, Even Binance, he just got done for money. money he was advising too. customers on how to get around the KYC. Yeah. Yeah. So they were messaging clients saying, buy through this NC yeah. instead I mean, to, to skirt know, regulation. You see this, the messages between him yeah. and his staff, like, yeah. bro, literally money laundering. Yeah, you know. yeah, he know like he, he's all of that that argument of like it's only used for crime. I'd say Binance is ninety percent of that in terms of they were moving money for some shady characters. Yeah, that's true. I mean, in the overall grand scheme of things, like I think Chainalysis does a you know Chainalysis, yeah, the blockchain forensics yeah. lot. They do a really good crypto crime report every year, and I think like in terms of the overall flows, it's something like zero point one percent, which is the dollar's know, the best thing for mo- laundering money in the I world. I mean, anonymous. You talk about anonymous hand to hand payments, mm. cash. Yeah. yeah, that's still the leading She's way to. Yeah, yeah. Like if you okay, so for example, if you were to go on the dark web, you know, uh, maybe up to about 2015, if you wanted to buy something that wasn't technically legal in your state, or um, they would demand Bitcoin. Mm. But because Bitcoin is transparent, and because um, Chainalysis, uh, Elliptic, which is based in London, another blockchain forensics lot, DOJ, like law enforcement, have been following Bitcoin for so long, people won't accept it anymore. So now that a lot of people that might have missed out on Bitcoin or mm. Ethereum, they want to get into altcoins and altcoin season. So these are alternative coins. Um, other like, coins. Other coins. Yeah, so like what you said, say, Bitcoin, Ethereum, everything else. Everything else, exactly. Yeah. So everything Ethereum's else. Ethereum's an altcoin, technically, as well, isn't it? Technically. But anyway, technically. It is. There's um, a lot of Bitcoiners that would say Ethereum's the first altcoin, but yeah. Yeah, that's on. true. The strongest blue chip altcoin, the only blue chip altcoin. Obviously, you don't want to encourage people to get into altcoins, but... Do you yourself ever get into altcoins? Um, have you invested in altcoins? Um, in the last two, so this is my third bull market. Uh, in the last two, I did and I lost a load of money because uh, if it went up, I got greedy and I bought more and I never sold and I was left holding the bag at the end of it. And this time round, I'm going to do it properly. DCN to Ethereum, never sell. Or sell, take profits on the way up. In general, Again, if you don't know what you're buying, I wouldn't buy it. I can't strong. I can't stress that enough because you don't know where it's going. You don't know where it's come from. You don't know when it's going. You know, like you don't know how liquid it is. You know, you, are you going to be able to get your money out at the other end? Um, and again, just don't invest in anything you you don't understand. You know, you say that you don't don't invest in stuff you don't understand, but you've said you've studied Ethereum extensively for years mm. and you still don't understand it. <laughs> so I mean, it's not that I don't understand it totally. Like, you know, I said, I'm never going to be a cryptographer. Like, you know, I'm never going to be a mathematician. Um, I think I understand the basic value proposition. That is yeah. that is enough for me. Um, I think not investing in something you don't, under, don't understand is like, do you know the name of it? And you may know the price of it, but you don't know what it does. Yeah. And you don't know how it makes money more specifically. And you don't know, does it put out more in token incentives than it makes in revenue if it's a blockchain? Yeah. Simple stuff like that. Yeah. It's like, I understand how Alphabet makes money. I understand that it's, you know, traditionally speaking, it might be slightly undervalued compared to the other Magnificent Seven. I know the ad market, I know this, but I don't know how they code their, their software. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and this is probably what you're saying. You, you understand how the business makes money, the potential of the business. You don't necessarily understand the underlying technology. That's correct. Like, you know, I don't really understand how electricity works, mm. but I can still turn on, on and off a light, you know, and I can still invest in renewable energy businesses because I kind of understand how they make money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've not played it as smart. Like I, I had mates who, in every ball run, I, I have a mate who comes forward, who becomes the crypto expert of the lads group. And he's talking and he's like, mm-hmm. you know, he's laser eyed and he's doing all these chart analysis and all of this. And he's doing okay. And then he disappears and says, oh, no, it's all a scam. Yeah, I mean, because te- he's been chart, an- chart analysis, when you're doing technical analysis, yeah. is basically like ast- astrology. Yeah, you know, yeah. you can draw any line on any chart. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. you know. But I've just consistently bought the whole time and, and I've done really well mm-hmm. off the back of that. And it's the same approach that I have to 
my stock portfolio of, I don't really That's know what's going to happen. Because you've got an investing philosophy, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You're looking at the long term yeah, yeah. and you're trying to use your noggin when everyone is going crazy. Right? Yeah, I, I, you know, I buy a bit more when it goes down and I buy a bit less when it goes super yeah. high. And, you know, I do, I do, I, do, I, mean, I that, am weak that is as well. great, but yeah. it's, that's against human nature. And that's yeah. something that you have to learn to do, mm-hmm. not something that you do instinctively. Yeah, but as in, I think index fund investors are well placed to, to use that. And I mm. think a lot of people, you know, they beat down the indexes and they say, oh, you know, you're boring and enjoy your 9%. I'm going to go get 400% on my, my pancake flips. Well, yeah, you, you know. might do that, but can you get your money yeah, out? Exactly. Yeah. And are you going to sell? Because I mean, yeah, nobody, nobody can time the market. No. And you might sell the top, you might sell the bottom. Might, I mean... Whereas the indexes are good at just like showing up every month and buying in, you know, and I think that's yeah, a good Yeah, and they skill. don't have massive amounts of stress in their life. No. But yeah. do you think there's a lot of emotion in crypto? Like if my friend calls me and says, dude, I just made like seven grand and I only put in 200 pounds in Dogecoin, mm-hmm. then it kind of makes you go, oh, maybe I should buy some that. Dogecoin. Yeah, sell that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but sell people, that. That's, that's how that the market is- goes because people are yeah. like, oh, he made money, he made money. He doesn't know. He's not smarter than me. I'll just listen to what he said and then they end up Lose These people aren't the wrong investing time. though, are they? They're not investing there. They're, they're, trying they're to get trading rich. and chasing around narratives. You yeah, know, like yeah. They, they invest. It's this point of, I have a portfolio. I have two to 4% that I put into crypto every month. And if it moonshots, it will do great things for my overall portfolio. If it goes to zero, then that's fine. But and if I- It's much easier to listen to the other guy than to listen to the sensible guy. Because yeah. the sensible guy is boring, yeah. not exciting. Um, but you just end up with this like herd behavior, you know, herd mentality. It's like, oh, that guy's gone massive. He doesn't know any more than me. In fact, yeah. I think he's stupider than I am. Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. so like- I lent him I, 50 quid last month and now he's, now he's just made 20 grand. I'm going to do that too. Yeah. Um, so usually the, the boring way is the way that you actually make money um, and chasing the returns and buying whiff coins is the way that you lose money. Whiff coins are like uh, Yeah. I think it's a good idea to treat crypto as an investment and not as just gambling or trying to get rich quick. And that's that's the people who normally get hurt, the ones who are trying to get rich quick. That's the problem is, man. Don't like, do their research. People put people get very emotional. People get very greedy. Um, and greed is not a term of disrespect. It's just fear and greed, man. You know, that's just how markets work. Yeah. Um, and they overinvest and they get themselves in trouble. The problem is, people see this as like, being stupid and getting it wrong, it doesn't mean you're not going to make a crap ton of money if you get lucky, but you might be one out of 10,000 people and it's a lottery ticket at the end of the day, or you're, you know, scooting around on the back end of a betting website, betting on Lithuanian basketball at 2am. Yeah, you know, been there. <laughs> Division four Lithuanian basketball at 2am, actually. My guy. I'll have you know. My who's, guy. The best, who's the messy of that league? <laughs> Who is it? But you know, those matches are crazy because like Turkish football division for my friend used sure to get rigged. They're all rigged. Yeah, so you'll see, like a, you'll see like a 12 nil. My friend be like, dude, bet on over four goals. I'm like, really? And then it'll be 12 nil. And sometimes Betfair will pull the pull the whole market because they realize that there's some like match fixing going on. It's crazy. Well, it's the same with the altcoins and the low levels. When the market caps are tiny, like mm. one guy can influence it and you get an influence. Yeah, and you also them. don't know if he's pre-mined. You know, you mm. don't know the people like, so for our cryptocurrency that we're going to launch together, we're going to make it fair and equitable and we're going to like not do any pre-mine so that we don't own any, any of the supply before we put it on the market. That would be my idea if I was to do a crypto. But in the small cap altcoins, you got no idea who's behind it. So it was safe, Moon. A load of crap. Like, oh, so many people. Hey, that's like, my clients. It's going to the moon. It's going to the moon. I told you they were a scam when I you know. came out. They all got, they're all going to prison for a long time. Safe in your crypto line. Yeah, we're we'll going to prison. Safe and moon. He's like, safe oh, and I'm, moon. I'm bringing a client on and they're called safe moon. I was like, they man, took, those took, guys are chances. They took me out to Marlborough to some fancy hotel. Yeah, nice, well, nice, yeah. Guys, yeah. nice guys. Nice guys. They had a lot of money. Not anymore. Sign them up. Yeah. They've been indicted. Yeah. Yeah. They've got gunners, mate. They're going to go to prison for a long time. Yeah, don't indict me, guys. I just, they were just my client. Yeah. And if you look at it, they copy and pasted the code off something else it was a joke yeah. but the, the the amount of hopium around that was staggering there is and i mean the thing the thing that we were not really mentioned as well is like crypto is something that's born on the internet right and like it thrives a lot of the community thrives on memes you know and what is a meme like it was coined in 1976 by richard dawkins like it's mimetic it's a self-perpetual self-perpetuating idea you know um there's lots of irony, you know, there's lots of Reddit, like there's lots of uh, other websites that I don't really want to mention. Like, you know, it's, um, this is how it kind of creates this community around the idea of community and culture. 
and gets you to hold on to something that maybe you don't really know what it is, but because other people that you know and like are, and are fun that you're in it, then you're kind of in it too. That is so wild. I never can't believe you said I actually got into crypto because of some memes. Like in lockdown, um, there was a meme and it was like, um, we were all sitting down in COVID and there was a meme and it was a, a dad talking to his daughter and his son. Yeah. And then his daughter's like, daddy, what did you do in like the pandemic? And then he, <laughs> the dad goes, I bought loads of Bitcoin. And then the son goes, fucking legend. Yeah. And like that, that, that meme got, I was like, I want to tell my kids this one day. And that literally just had me. Do you see how it. silly that is? It's, but, that's, <laughs> but that's got me that's deep internet, in, got my culture, crypto bro. bags yeah. full and got yeah. me buying. Don't buying. do that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the culture, yeah, the meme, it really got me. And I still picture that meme. I'm like, yeah, one day I'm going to tell my son, here's your like 50 Ethereum, your daddy's a legend. And so like, it's kind of, it, it all ties in and you keep seeing crypto memes like, People that bought at the bottom, mm. people that bought, you know, so it's like, it's perpet self perpetuating. Yeah, so, self perpetuating. Yeah. Keeps, yeah. Keeps and I think you. like, you know, now that we have like Bitcoin and Ethereum ETPs that people can buy and it's becoming regulated and Bitcoin ETFs in America, you know, like people who got into crypto earlier when they were saying, oh, it's criminals, fanatics, lunatics. <laughs> it's like, well, maybe just because the central bank doesn't like it doesn't mean I shouldn't be interested in it. You know, the kind of trust in those- Porn was the first thing on the internet. Yeah. And that became a bit Any new technology, yeah, Kodak, yeah. porn. Yeah. Yeah, Next yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come Rocket. Come Rocket. Crypto. Yeah. One of my clients as well. Yeah. No, it's never actually a crypto. That's one. You've never heard of Come Rocket. You've never heard of Come Rocket. Of course I have. Oh, good. I was going to say, yeah. You've got loads of them. Their, their <laughs> coins are called Cummies. <laughs> their, their cummies. Token. That's, that's the name of the token. It's called Cummies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making this up. I know the, I know the founder. She's a legend. Oh my God. Cummies to the See, moon, mate. Cummies to the moon. Everyone buy some cum rocket. You're, you're, no, you're stop don't saying that. Stop <laughs> saying that. Shit, man. We let I'm him, clearly we, joking, episode, guys. We're sat, here, we're sat here. We're talking about, you know, I don't know, like the debt crisis. And he's like, yeah, but I told you to buy Bitcoin last year. <laughs> <laughs> like, every fucking episode. We let him, we give him a little bit of leash. Okay, we'll have a crypto episode. He sits here saying, you know, buy cummies. Do you know why? Because I got traumatized by the bull run by everyone telling me I was stupid and that crypto is a scam and it's yep. all gone away. Amazing. And I'm like, now's a great time to buy. Oh, look at all you crypto boys. You're all broke now. Oh. That's another great meme, and, man. If yeah. you see the line, uh, it's a line that goes like this and it says, bubble, dead, bubble, dead, bubble, yeah. dead. Yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always yeah. a scam and it's got- How many it. times Bitcoins died? Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. a website that tracks the yeah. amount of times- JP, yeah. JP Morgan and people were saying Bitcoin's dead, it's over, and then they're buying more. I That's mean, the big, um, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, they've got a history of trading against the, com trading against the public statement. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, let's, let's end it on this then. I, I can- you know, with everything that's happened to say Bitcoin and the, the landscape itself, mm -hmm. you know, we've had all the scams, we've had everything, and it seems to be more legitimate today than it ever has been in terms of there's there's been mainstream adoption. Mm -hmm. We can we can actually, you know, it's, that's another meme. The mainstream money's coming. Well, it's it's coming now. It, it's here. I could say that I think it's far more likely that Bitcoin hits a million than it hits zero. You know, at this point. Mm -hmm. But have you got a price prediction on Bitcoin or Ethereum? For when? Let's say five years, ten years, and thirty years. Um, my first answer is no, <laughs> uh, because, you know, no one can see the future and yeah. asking people to make predictions is like pulling numbers out of your ass. Yeah. Um, and that's what, you know, investment bank analysts who follow stocks do. Yeah. You know, they put price targets on things without telling you how long they think it's going to be until that hits that price. Yeah. But I suppose, you know, there or, is some- Or they might yeah. say that, that they think that that's the fair value now. So some price targets are like, my target is this because I think that's what it should be worth right now. Sure. Yeah. So what do you think if you, I, I know on your DCF model, you said that mm. you think it's three times. So you think Ethereum at 10K is- Ethereum, the at, Ethereum at 10K in five years is reasonable, I think. Yeah. Bitcoin 120 to 150. In five what? years. Mm -hmm. Quite conservative. It is conservative. I, like I mean, that. I prefer to be conservative than like it's going to a million and like, you know, let's just go out and buy gold Lambo boys and like go around the neighborhood and, you know. But when it does, we'll, we'll do that. Think, oh, we'll definitely we'll do that. that. We'll definitely do that. What do you think in 30 years? Who knows, Too far man? out. Who knows? I mean, you know, we could all get hit by a comet within that, that time frame. That's too too long for me to predict. Big but massive like, cum rocket hits the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode. We did cover a lot of ground there. So if you want a summary of everything, we write a newsletter. It's really good. You can sign up below in the description. And if you enjoyed this episode, trust me, you're going to love this one.